sir we are live now okay thank you honorable dignitaries esteemed faculty and dear delegates a very good evening to one and all i dr rishikesh feel privileged to welcome you all on behalf of the entire team at mqr pharmaceuticals we at mqr are proud to present no thrombosis live inbox our highly acknowledged scientific program dedicated to exploring the multifaceted landscape of interventional cardiology this program serves as a bridge between knowledge and practical application aimed at equipping us with the tools needed to enhance the lives of those affected with the cardiac diseases i take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome to our respected course director dr m s hiramat sir sir is director cath lab at ruby hall pune president csi 2017 program chair csi conference 2016 he is convener of national interventional council of india csi between 2004 to 2006 sir has proctored many interventional cardiologists and has given live courses across the globe sir has great experience in peripheral angioplasty including legs iliac and carotids sir has also participated in some ground breaking clinical trials thank you sir for your continued commitment and guidance to us for running this program regularly your expertise and fan for english moderators professor dr k m k reddy sir and dr gurunath parade sir are poised to share their knowledge insights and practical wisdom to empower us in the fight against the global health challenge of cardiac diseases it is an honor for me to introduce our distinguished moderators for today professor dr k m k reddy sir is senior consultant and interventional cardiologist at apollo hospital jubilee hills hyderabad sir is senior professor of cardiology and hod cardiology at osmania medical college hyderabad since 2016 sir was president of csi telangana chapter in 2020 and 21 sir is member of subject expert committee of cardiology at cdsc of dcj new delhi sir is faculty in national and international cardiology meetings sir has more than 50 publications in various international and national journals sir is also principal investigator in global clinical trial named select sir is national lead and principal investigator in a global clinical trial named zeus sir is also principal investigator in many other national clinical trials thank you sir for joining today's program thank you we have moderator dr gurunath parade sir with us sir is chief cardiologist at ashwini cooperative hospital solapur sir has performed more than 20000 angiographies and more than 7000 angioplasties sir has created the vcd sir idai to spread awareness among the people about heart attack sir is founder and editor of medical bulletin polypill to disseminate the medical information among medical practitioners sir has written numerous articles in newspapers magazines for public education sir has received the international rotary millennium award in 2001 for outstanding social service sir is speaker at various national and international conferences so dr gurunath parade sir will join in shortly for this program i would also like to introduce and extend a warm welcome to our esteemed speakers for today dr satish parsuraman sir sir is structural and interventional cardiologist at apollo specialty hospitals at madurai and the case topic which is discussing today is stuck open aortic valve a cath lab nightmare thank you sir for accepting our invitation to present the case we have second speaker dr pranav shamraj sir sir is consultant cardiologist and director cath lab at bkl walavalkar medical college and hospital at chiplun ratnagiri the topic for his case today is refractory no flow in a case of stemi with delayed presentation thank you dr pranav sir for accepting our invitation to present the case and finally i would like to extend a special welcome to all the delegates who have joined today's program it is an honor to have such an esteemed audience and renowned experts among us let me brief you all on the meeting agenda for today we'll kick start the program with opening remarks and context setting from our course director dr hiramat sir the meeting will proceed further with the first case presentation by dr satish parsuraman sir following this we'll have the discussion on the case where all the faculty members will participate second case will be presented by dr pranav shamraj sir it will be followed by discussion among the faculty members post the discussion of second case we'll have the concluding remarks by our esteemed course director i request audience to post their questions in the comment box so that we can take up those questions in the end 
Without further ado, let's embark on this educational voyage together as we endeavor to enhance our understanding of interventional cardiology. I request Dr. M.S. Hiramat, sir, to share his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you, Kish, for that introduction. This thing has gone on beyond, I think, more than two years. And uh, the number of people joining for each subsequent meeting is always higher, which obviously means that people are getting drawn to this meeting. And obviously, MQR has managed to generate tremendous interest in this meeting. The aim is very appropriate when we call it no thrombosis. And uh, MQR has this molecule, Alexin, which has been a very strong molecule, very effective, very useful under emergency settings. Many of my referring doctors from nearby places, like 70 millimeters from where I practice, they would phone that they have an acute MI whether to shift or whether to thrombolize and shift. And we have so much trust in MCURE, MCURE's Lexim, that I always tell them, rise and shift. And see the efficacy of the molecule is very crucial. So if you give a molecule and it doesn't work, I think it has more problems than, so in those cases, I would have probably said, don't give anything, just shift the patient. But we have a very strong belief in this molecule, the relaxim. So I always tell them to dice and shift. I don't know what, my co-chair uh, probably do. Dr. Reddy, what is your... Uh... Sir, uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah. See, basically, I mean, uh, nowadays, uh, we are getting a very, very good response in uh, uh, thrombolysis at the peripheries or within the ambulance thrombolysis or even at home thrombolysis and shifting the patient. That is giving a lot of... Uh, uh, satisfaction to treat an acute MI or uh, uh, such a, uh, I mean, uh, situations. We are saving many lives. Actually, there is a project called uh, uh, STEMI project. That is, it is very active even in Telangana state. We are very actively involved as a hub from Osmania Medical College. I completely agree with you, sir. Yes. Is the other uh, I think he's like, likely to join. Dr. Dr. Parale, sir, will join in sometime. So he's not here to give the opening comments. Yes. All right. Can we have the first presentation in that case, Rishikesh? Yes, sir. Dr. I request Sati. Dr. Satish, sir. Yes. I hope can hope all of you can hear me. Uh, thank you so much for your invitation. Thank you for so much for the uh, introduction, Dr. Rishikesh. Happy to uh, be uh, with uh, Professor Reddy and uh, Professor Hiramat and esteemed colleagues who are all uh, consultant cardiologists uh, in their own centers. Uh, my name is Dr. Satish Parasuraman. I'm working in Madurai Apollo um, in Tamil Nadu. Previously, I used to work in the UK, and that's where this case comes from. I think it's an interesting case. I think it will be uh, 
good to see what your thoughts are and what you would have done in a different in these situations. So this is a picture of a uh, council house in Aberdeen, Aberdeen, which is uh, quite. It's a. It's called a great granite city, not in the north of Scotland. All the buildings are made of granite. Uh, you would see in England when you go to England, it would be all built of uh, bricks, red bricks, houses and red bricks. And when you go to Scotland, as we say, north of Scotland, you would see um, granite buildings, uh, which will be grey. So it's called the grey city, and this is one of the one of the important buildings there. Going to the case, we had a 69-year-old gentleman uh, who was uh, on holidays. He had a mechanical aortic valve replacement about 20 years ago, and he was on warfarin. And he presents to the emergency department with acute onset chest pain and breathlessness over the previous hour. ECGs showed anterolateral ST depression, and he rapidly developed pulmonary edema. He was seen by the junior cardiologist in the emergency department, and uh, rightly he thought about an acute myocardial infarction, either multivessel disease or left main stem um, occlusion, or even a thrombus in the uh, in, in a left main or circumflex or a bifurcation, because the ST depression was quite deep, running from V1 to V6. Um, INR was 3.9, and the emergency team also loaded him with aspirin and the tachycardia. So uh, we took a guide because of the patient's clinical situation. We decided to take a guide straight away through the right radial artery. Let's uh, sort the uh, problem out. So we went through the right radial artery, and uh, with, I think this is an EBU3 guide, uh, and went in. And the, but actually, the left, left main proximal LAD circumflex, everything was normal. So then we were hunting for the right. Right was a bit difficult to find. Um, we couldn't see the right ca right couldn't be engaged easily with the JR4 catheter. Uh, but we realized at this point that there was something odd about the aortic valve. We did not know which type of aortic valve it was. Uh, we know it's a mechanical valve and he needs warfarin, but we felt that the valve was not uh, warping perhaps as it should, although we did not. This was not an end on view as he would normally do with a or a cordial or a cranial. This is just a just an, just we thought. Uh, the blood pressure at this moment was about uh, 100 by 40. Then we crossed with the JR4 catheter, we crossed it to the LV, and the LV EBP was 40 as well. Essentially, there was no difference between the aortic and, um, um, aortic and uh, uh, LV pressures. We did an iotogram. Iotogram showed free flowing aortic regurgitation. Um, so at this point, we realized that we have a aortic valve that is stuck open uh, and it's not closing and the patient is got having a torrential um, free-flowing AR. The patient was deteriorating rapidly. He was uh, going into worsening acidosis, uh, pun pulmonary edema. He was initially on uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation but was put into uh, a ventilator. Cardiothoracic surgeon was called in. He was in the lab as well. He was reluctant to take the patient to the theater because uh, of the worsening deterioration. I think his lactate was about 10. Thrombus, uh, thrombosis of the valve was thought about, but uh, felt less likely given the INR of 3.9. But again, um, it could have been the cause. It could have been the cause. So we felt the most likely problem here is a stucco valve that stuck open due to uh, panus formation in the valve. So we tried to do some um, maneuvers. We, this is an IMA catheter. We thought we'll just hook the IMA catheter or we'll use the normal O3-5 wire to, to uh, flick the valve uh, and to kickstart it to open. Um, but uh, this, although we tried, it didn't work properly. We couldn't... Um, uh, no, sir, this is the normal O3-5 uh, J wire. So... We thought it'll give a little bit more hook, a little bit more, I don't know, probably a little bit more grip. And then we also were trying to use the Lima catheter as well, Lima diagnostic catheter as well, but it didn't work. Then we took a pigtail catheter, which we used for diatogram. We thought we'd use the pigtail to adjust the pigtail itself to hook around the valve and flick in one side or the other. We tried both sides, but um, uh, but nothing happened really. So, um, yeah. So we tried to decide to do some uh, unusual things. So we got an electrophysiologist doing some EP studies next door. So we got his uh, 
got him as well. So we upgraded the right radial. Was it an angled pigtail or a normal pigtail? A uh, normal pigtail, sir. I think it's a bit uh, deformed, actually. It's just a normal uh, okay. six-trench pigtail catheter. Just I think it's a bit deformed because of multiple attempts to uh, uh, do Go things, on. actually. Yeah. So this was so then um, we upgraded to a seven French uh, sorry eight French radial sheath. This was a big man, big uh, British man. So he had a big uh, radial artery. So we put a eight French radial sheath, and uh, we we introduced an SRO catheter, which we normally use on the venous side for um, delivering EP equipment. Actually, so this is the, the one at the top is the SRO catheter there. Um, then uh, yeah. So this is the SRO catheter there. Then we got the EP guy who was uh, doing some electrophysiology studies next door, and he tried decided to use some steerable quad cat to smack the valve or to go underneath the valve to steer it up and down and do something about it. Um, but nothing really happened actually. Nothing really. Patient was uh, still worsening, and the anesthetists were complaining. So at this point, then we decided to use a. Uh, uh, this is, I think, extreme maneuvers like a biopsy catheter because we had an eight print sheet right to the aortic root. Um, we thought we would just use the we just use a biopsy catheter to catch some part of the um, um, some part of the valve and to uh, try and uh, try and make it open. I think during one of those attempts, we gripped some part of the valve because we didn't know which one it was, and we gripped some part of the valve and then we pulled it up. Um, or down, we don't know exactly what, which one, which part of it worked, whether this one worked or whether pulling it up worked, we don't know which one worked. So um, soon afterwards, once we, with the, we didn't know what happened, and then soon afterwards, the Actually, it's the surgeon, cardiothoracic surgeon, who pointed out uh, the diacrotic notch now in the aortic waveform. You should have done something because we couldn't see the valve clearly. We didn't, first of all, we didn't take a good picture of the valve itself and see the valve opening. We didn't know with what type of valve it was. You know, it was a mechanical valve. We didn't know what type of valve it was. But um, rightly, as he said, uh, as soon as we saw the diacrotic notch, then we did a uh, pigtail injection, which was quite good. This showed the valve was. Um, um, release and is functioning again. So patient recovered very rapidly on the table. He was extubated within a few hours. We thought the panis formation secondary uh, was the cause of the aortic valve that was stuck open. Equity granted that uh, later on showed the valve was functioning well and there was only mild central AR. The gated CT next day did not add much to what was the cause. There was no, there was some, some amount of panis there, but nothing great to say we should be doing that or this. But um, after discussion, we, we we looked at the valve. He didn't have, know the details about the valve either, but we think it was one of those Medtronic HAL valves, which is like a single disc aortic valves uh, from the 1970s. Um, after discussion with the company, and uh, we, we, dis we advised the patient that we get the valve, we do a redo surgery for this patient who is just 69. We don't know exactly the cause of the uh, stuck open valve, but we had to do it, we said, but uh, the patient uh, declined and uh, seems to be still doing well when I saw him about a year ago. So uh, thank you. I'll stop there. What do you think would be the reason for stuck wall? Just a clot or? Uh, we don't think it's a clot, sir. We didn't see the clot either in the CT or uh, echocardiogram. We think it is um, it is just the panis, slowly growing panis over 20 years, even though mild. It just affected the valve in such a way that uh, it got stuck at one, uh, in, a, in a particular place when it was open. He was well anticoagulated. The yeah, IN is quite good. Yeah, at least INR then was quite good. And um, yeah, he was, uh, he was well anticoagulated. He believed that. Um, Thrombus was not the cause here. And okay. as and also by the so the patient sorry, sir. sinus rhythm? Patient was in sinus rhythm, sir. Yes, sir. Throughout he was in sinus rhythm, yes. Okay, okay. Yes, he was in sinus rhythm throughout. Yeah, I think most likely some amount of panis only is a possibility. But uh, you and your patient is definitely uh, fortunate enough 
<laughs> to come out like that yeah so it was a hairy situation but it was it was like uh, i think it was it was uh, yeah i think uh, normally he, uh, he could have been taken to the theater i'm not sure why our surgeon didn't want to take him to the theater at this point i think many surgeons were rushed to the theater even though with the high inr etc uh, because i think he was lucky to survive that episode yes any comments from the audience uh, please actually it is a very interesting thing uh, i have uh, recently encountered with one of my colleagues facing almost a similar situation i, I think it is described it rarely happens and uh, probably mechanically by meddling with the catheters and some amount of wires i think it has been reported and uh, it is a, it's a, a good a good uh, thought process that happened and a good try uh, probably um, i think definitely once that is released some amount of panas or some whatever uh, uh, or even a calcium spec sometimes can give a, a stuck position and uh, even though there, even though there are many things that are described like that but uh, in this case actually uh, giving a relief to the patient is a big thing that happened and i congratulate dr uh, satish to uh, have a scenario like this so oh, dr reddy i would probably feel we must must and must do something to this stuck valve yes sir i mean there is a huge amount of aortic regurg probably class 4 and uh, that is not going to allow the patient to breathe normally and happily over next how many years back is this 20 years old sir 20 years old no valve is 30 year old but uh, 20 that's when uh, back this was uh, but the case was about 3 years old 2020 21 so last 3 years he, you are following him and he's good i, I moved to india about 6 uh, months ago so i saw him last about uh, and one year ago so this is doing well so you have any connect with the patient uh, yeah i mean he is a bit of difficult patient actually he, he was an engineer and uh, he has his own ways of thinking how the valve works so he got all the documents from the metronic company uh, reading the uh, um, uh, you know all the brochures of the valve um, and uh, well, we wanted to publish the case he wouldn't let us write up the case really uh, but he allowed us to present the case so it was fine but uh, yeah he, he's a slightly different person he he did we struggled advice for the valve replacement and uh, we again he didn't want to have a valve replacement done um, still researching for an answer why the valve got stuck which i guess um, we might be able to say once we explant the valve unless then we can't say and that thing um maybe we can also i think uh, think over sir i think uh, dr hiramat may have a better idea but i am thinking it can be a simple wear and tear phenomena also some amount of uh, coating at some part of the thing might have gone or struck also is a possibility absolutely sir absolutely Something like an alloying material getting damaged at some part yes, because sir. it's 20 years old yes absolutely absolutely So one more thing, I think only one. I mean, I know it's a bit. It's a very rare case. Probably I'm not going to see it again, and uh, many of our audiences may yeah. not see them in the. But I think one of the one of the take home messages from this case was this that, um, which is very very. I think all of the senior guys will like. Everyone should listen to the, you know, ask to take the heart properly before taking the patient to the lab, uh, because we have all seen uh, via ventricular septal defects being diagnosed after, the stent uh, artery. or this one was an ar you know i know it's a bit when it's torrential it may be difficult to uh, hear i guess uh, but um, it's one of the things to think about you know it's, it's not just okay the patient has significant st depression pulmonary edema let's take him to the lab give him some tachycardia in the lab auscultation is quite important i think from my side i always listen to bsd murmurs mrs and uh, any ars because you know i think aortic dissection is one thing you might uh, confuse with um, Aortic dissection, aortic valve, the involved aortic valve and coronary can be one thing that we can miss before taking to the lab. 
uh, my uh, ventricular septal defect can be one thing that we might miss. We don't we don't want to stand these patients. We want to take them to the um, so they can for surgery after shooting the calories and also MR. So for all the from you know that's a lesson for our, for all of us. I think um, you know even though it was seen by another cardiologist in the emergency, we should all um, listen to auscultate the heart. You know even echocardiogram might take ages to be done and whatnot. But I think auscultation is very quick. Make sure there are no big murmurs. AR um, MR or VST, which will be very obvious in most cases. So finally, the right coronary was hooked? No. Later also. Your voice is not audible, sir. So you are on um, mute. Sorry, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, sir. We, we didn't hold the right coronary. But actually, in the diatogram, I, didn't, I forgot to show the picture. The diatogram, the right coronary was visible. It was quite flowing. Yeah. That's flowing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The last with pigtail catheter. It fills the left system very well, but it still doesn't show the right. Um, I'll just show you one slide, sir. I think uh, I'll just go back to... Um, yeah, I think this one, hope. yes. No, I think I'll even go back to... Uh, uh, this one, sir. I think this was the one that was the after searching for the right... Uh, after searching for the... Um, yeah, this is the one. It shows the filling of the left system very well. I think you can see it as well, the right coronary and the higher up. I, I'm not sure how the video plays, but it's it's an awkward position. There's the right dilatation, but you can see the right yeah. coronary a bit higher up. And then it's... Um, I'm not sure how disease it is, but... Slightly posterior also, yeah. Yes. Higher and posterior, yeah. Yeah, higher up and posterior. So we, we didn't hook it up at the end, but um, we, we understood the respect and... Okay. I think get a CT angiogram sometime now. Uh, we, did, we did the CT angiogram, sir. It didn't show much. It showed some fairness, some, uh, but nothing more, unfortunately. Nothing to add to why, you know, uh, any significant plot or anything. No, we didn't get anything more than that. But I want everybody to go with the feeling that this is an acute aortic rigor. Because of the stuck valve and definite treatment for acute aortic rigors is obviously a surgical repair. So, your gentleman got away, Dr. Satish, with nothing much. You gave license during the initial presentation. No, no, sir. We didn't give license uh, the initial presentation. Was the ECG showed? Uh, I don't have the ECG, but the ECG showed gross anterolateral acid depression from B1 to B6, like about four or five millimeters. Um, so I think it was initially felt not thrombolizable ECG, but it was felt like a left main stem or a multi vessel disease kind of picture. So okay. not thrombolized, but INR was three point nine. And uh, yeah, so that is the question, sir. I have a doubt. Same doubt. Is it that 3.9 INR still demands some amount of uh, lysis? I, I would feel, uh, I mean, what is the explanation in this case? It's a stuck valve. And stuck valve acutely must go to the theater or we must lyse it. Mm -hmm. So since the patient is refusing the first option, going to the theater, you must offer him a uh, license. I would okay. have liced him despite an INR of uh, whatever, 3.9. Okay. Shikesh, what about your election? Is it safe with an INR of this level, 3. Point odd? I need to check it, sir, in the details. Yeah, anyone from your group, scientific group from MQR team wants to add, add into this discussion? I'll get back to this uh, sir, question. 
I think All election right. will not prolong PT. That's what I remember. It should not prolong, I think, PT. Prothrom in time. Should not be prolonged by this. May be useful. I mean, the physical condition is so bad yeah. that, yes, you are justified in using a litig. So we are not trying to say that um, one is better than the other. Yeah. But yes, I think uh, should definitely nice. I mean, we must do something. The patient is refusing surgery. Uh, is what, is it... Lies with a small small dose or some. But the patient had proved you and my me wrong because he's gone three years and nothing has gone wrong with him. You're sure patient is alive and doing well. Yes, sir, as of last year, yes, he's doing well. Okay. So instead of pharmacological lysis, he has done a mechanical lysis. <laughs> All right. Okay. Rishikesh, uh, should we go to the next presentation? Yes, sir. So I request Dr. Pranav Shamraj, sir, to present his case. Also, we have uh, Dr. Gurunath Parade, sir, our second moderator, who has joined just now. Uh, a few time, a few minutes back, he has joined. Welcome, sir. Hello, Hello Dr. Gurunath. Welcome to the scene. Sir, please unmute yourself. Uh, I'm not... Hello. Hello. Hello, very much, sir. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, I'm not... Muted. You can't hear me? Yeah, yeah I, no, can no, hear I can hear you. Parade, sir, uh, he was on mute, so I just requested okay. him to unmute. Okay. okay. All right. Let's go to the next presentation. Dr. Pranav Shamraj. Dr. Pranav, you are in Chipron, isn't it? I think please unmute yourself. We can't hear you at all. Uh, good evening, uh, respected Hiraman sir. Good evening, uh, both the moderators, Dr. Eddy sir and Dr. Gurunath Parai sir. So uh, I would like to present my case, uh, which is different from what the case is presented just uh, previous case. So uh, I'm putting up this case as an enteral MI. Quite a delayed presentation and where uh, establishing the flow was very challenging and uh, there were a lot of efforts taken in it. There is a bit of uh, lag. Yeah. So this patient was a 63 year old male. Uh, he had an interval MI. Uh, he was, uh, I mean, he couldn't identify the symptoms and then referred at a window period of 20, 20 hours. His EF was around 30-35%. He was a, a diabetic, hypertensive, and his renal function was a creatinine of 1.5 with the EGF around 65. So basically, <clears throat> though he was not in frank cardiogenic shock, but his the blood pressure was borderline and the heart rate was above 100. So <clears throat> this uh, was like this is a case done in November. Uh, so this was the NGO. Uh, the RCA was absolutely normal and uh, this was the left system where the LED is 100% cut off from the origin with a short stump and the LCX is a non-dominant artery and this is the AP cranial view where after a short stump uh, there is a grade 5 thrombus and distally there is no flow in the LED. Now because this patient was <clears throat> not asymptomatic, like he, he was in um, tachycardia, borderline pressures, and though he had no angina, but he was ha having uh, bilateral crepitation, so he was in heart failure. So, with this, I thought of opening the artery, at least to know what, what is it, like what is the LED. We don't know about the total viability of the segments, uh, but 
patient being uh, symptomatic as it is an indication to open the artery. So why are you so hesitant? I mean, this is an acutely occluded Yes, LAD. sir. I, I mean, I'm not hesitant, yeah, sir. I mean, just to... Occluded LAD, not a distal RCA or anything like that. And, so, and an osteal, osteoproximal LAD. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would have no hesitation in saying that uh, the LAD has to be addressed. Has to be addressed. At times, sir, when these proximal occlusions, most of the time the myocardium is totally lost. Uh, but I mean, the patients, uh, I mean, they are very, very symptomatic. Or even they are uh, presenting after three, four days uh, after they have uh, you know, come out of the acute phase. So even those patients, there is always a dilemma what to do. Because on table, maybe a day three, day four, uh, and we don't have the facility of doing a viability or even the patient coming back again, if you send him anywhere or uh, he directly goes home and then doesn't appear to the hospital. Let's ask the expert, Dr. Reddy, you have any comments? I mean, will you go back, Dr. Shamraj, on uh, doing an angioplasty at this stage? I mean, you have an acutely operated LAD proximal. This, this patient is a symptomatic patient, sir. And uh, this is like Directly, the only way to take him out of the symptom is to open the artery. Yes, he has come to you for that. You know? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, yes. So, whichever way, I think you must must open the vest. Okay. One, one, I think it is a since it is a delayed presentation, probably still there is an ongoing pain as per your conversation. I think it is the right indication to go ahead and intervene in that. And see, see, he is a diabetic. And yes, you sir, yourself said he didn't realize when he was symptomatic. So I'm probably right. he's having that episode, silent episode. So he must be having still ongoing ischemia. You won't know. It has to be opened. The proximal LED, I, I won't have any hesitation in opening it. Yes. I think it should be opened. Yes. Whatever yes. the little benefit he has, we have to give him that benefit. Yes, sir. So with this in mind... One, uh... one, more, one more concept is when the patient is having a failure and some amount of discomfort, suppose, if there is a symptom, and probably that tells the indirectly the viability also. True. Ongoing heart failure is one of the important uh, markers when yes. they don't have the obvious angina. Yes. So, with this, uh, I thought of uh, crossing the uh, lesion. And uh, so, one wire I placed in the diagonal, which was seen, and I took another wire to enter the LED. So, this is a shoot after the wire, uh, the upper wire is in the diagonal and then the other wire is not able to go beyond this level. So, I was not sure like where exactly I have entered. Which and, one do you think? Uh, I thought this is maybe another branch of the same diagonal or the LED because it is not uh, going or I didn't like, there was a resistance at this point. So, while wiring. So, after a little bit of maneuvering, uh, the wire has gone uh, distally. So, I thought, okay, no, uh, maybe but, there was a region. Which region wire below. are you using? Uh, sir, I am using a run-through wire, sir. Run-through NS. Like, that is a regular wire we are using or we use C on blue. At times, BMW, but this uh, workhorse wire was a run-through. So, uh, the wire was advanced uh, distally and then uh, the plan was <clears throat> whether to do a, uh, like go with a low profile balloon and just uh, see uh, what is the feel of the artery at, if needed, a very low pressure dilatation to, if we can establish a distal flow and then uh, think of the next things. Why not so, thrombus aspiration first? Yes, sir. Thrombus. So thrombus, because I was not sure whether, I mean, uh, this is a right, because there was a lot of resistance while uh, passing down the wire. So I thought of just at least, uh, if the balloon goes easily, I would have taken a thrombus aspiration. So actually, I tried with a one point. At this stage, thrombus aspiration and small quantum of diluted contrast. That would probably help us decide whether you are in LAT or no. And, and, uh, and then yes, if you are reasonable, I would probably feel that you get more aggressive with the best. So 
I first tried to go with a 1.5 uh, balloon. The, the and... other comment I will say, if you are not sure many times if you are, whether you are in LED, sometimes lateral view helps. You right. know, definitely right. in lateral view, whether it is in the anterior vessel or it is in the diagonal, that definitely sorts out. So many times you go to the lateral view. Yeah, uh, uh, ninety are they all right? Yes, yes. But I think he was sure because the uh, distal it has gone. Yes, sir. And gone to the apex. He was reasonably sure, I think, uh, after no. No, then he should have gone with uh, gone ahead with thrombus aspiration. Uh -huh. I, I did. First. I did everything. Uh -huh. so I did everything. So here I took a low profile balloon. Then it crossed. Then I took a thrombus step. And uh, unfortunately, hey, one more co one more comment uh, here I would like to make. If you have very osteal or a proximal LED occlusion, a thrombotic occlusion, I would always wire a circumflex because many times the thrombus migrates into the circumflex, you will have a disaster on the table. So you a wire has to be in circumflex before you have manipulate anything in the LED. Sir, actually, uh, yes, sir. Very, uh, that, that's a very important point. But here the circumflex was very uh, small caliber. And already had two wire in, so uh, uh, I mean, I took a small balloon. It went on, but the thrombuster was not able to go beyond the lesion where it is seen, where, where the LED is occluded. So I did not try to push it hard. So I thought of just take, let me take a one point four longer balloon. So this is a one point five into fifteen millimeter, and at low pressure, I thought if I can understand anything into this, like with dilatation, but. As we see, there is uh, no help with this. So the thrombuster could not uh, the thrombuster could not be passed beyond the diagonal wire. So I thought thought of going low pressure all the way into the mid LED and to see if anything can help in this case. So again, with no uh, like low two to three or four atmospheric pressure, uh, the one point five over balloon, and then here it was like. Uh, I am stuck in the case, and this case I started. One more comment, I would look nice. If you have such a large, one more comment, please. Uh, I, if you have such a large thrombus burden, I would give also epsiximab uh, intracoronary that time. Yes, yes, sir. So I use all the through the guiding catheter. So we gave the whatever possible drugs we gave adrenaline, uh, adenosine, and also tyrofibin. We have. I don't have epsiximab, but I gave two boluses of tyrofibin, ten ml. And uh, Nicorandil also uh, was given. So that, that is the first protocol. I use a lot of adrenaline because that helps to uh, prevent hypotension, a uh, diluted dose of adrenaline. But uh, like I was not happy with this kind of flow. So I thought of taking a micro catheter and then to check uh, what is the scene. So here after taking a fine cross, I injected into the artery and here as we can see, so the wire has gone into a diagonal and then the diagonal is all across going laterally. And from the retrograde filling of the contour, the LED, uh, the flow is seen into the LED for a short segment. So, so this patient uh, had a early diagonal. Again, the D1 was a uh, tight lesion. And then he had a second diagonal, which was full of thrombus. And then the LED, which was also full of thrombus. And uh, the patient had multiple lesions. So I thought of uh, first tackling the like um, the diagonal. So D1, I just ballooned with the same 1.5 into 15 mm balloon. And then uh, again, a dilatation in the D2 and then trying to see the flow. So with this, uh, the diagonals were flowing and then the LED was occluded here. So I can see the septal and there is no flame flow in the uh, LED. And then the LED, bef bef like before the um, where it is occluded, is showing an intermediate lesion. So there is no critical lesion as such, uh, but the whole LED is full of thrombus. The LED, the diagonal. So even the diagonal origin, which look very critical now after a small uh, balloon dilatation, is looking pretty uh, non-critical. So I thought of going into the LED and then uh, try to get in the next uh, gadgets. 
so this is a wire in the led and uh, <clears throat> giving like a lot the, of d1 uh, wire diagonal one wire have you pulled back sir actually the with three wires it was not able to uh, like uh, yeah, take care of all the three wires so they are getting intertwined amongst themselves and uh, you are with seven french or six french this is six french sir six french radial so i thought of uh, like taking the wire into the d2 with the due risk because eventually i was not able to handle three wires there so this Uh, just trying to take a shoot that again try to take the thrombuster but I, uh, it was not going so i again took a micro catheter and after the dilatation i thought of seeing what is happening to the artery so uh, like i gave a lot of intra coronary um, uh, first adenosine then nicorandil adrenaline tyrofeban uh, meanwhile with all this uh, now it is almost 130 the case was started at 12 o'clock or and uh, more than one hour the patient is now started on noradrenaline and uh, low dose noradrenaline like he was very stable patient is not on aortic balloon pump uh, sir uh, aortic balloon pump the machine was not working that day sir so we have to balloon pump but there was some technical issue error so i thought of like we had before Uh, another case where I was not able to get a good flow in the LED, and then the reason in few of the cases where we had a myocardial bridge, and another case we had a diffuse thrombus in the LED and a diffusely diffused artery. So with this into mind, I thought of going uh, with balloon dilatation in the distal uh, zones of the LED. So I took a same one point five balloon, and here the balloon. I mean, in fact, there were the two on two occasion the balloon ruptured. Uh, so this is a different balloon, but a similar profile. So we can see the balloon is not opening well, and I don't know what is the caliber of the artery to go on very high pressure. So very uh, slow and gentle manipulation. So here at the proximal uh, LED or uh, proximal to the distal or the apical LED, the balloon opens well, but distally the balloon fails to expand. So and this is almost a pressure of fifteen uh, millimeters mercury. So meanwhile, little CPR was given for the patient. Then I took a one more balloon because this apical LED was looking very uh, uh, nasty to me. So then dilated with a one more balloon. Then again took in the micro catheter. Then gave a lot of uh, vasodilators, and then finally uh, did a pre dilatation with a one point five balloon. And then uh, this is a. angiographic picture after all the efforts so still there is no good flow even in the day, uh, like in all this because the, even with the micro catheter was not able to go so the diagonal wire came out so there is not a good flow so i thought of let me take a shoot from the micro catheter and see what is the artery so with a fine cross in the middle led the whole led is diffusely diseased and this is uh, like a very small caliber lumen which is seen imaging is not available and uh, also there is a lot of thrombus into the artery so with this i thought of going little more aggressive dilatation in the uh, led and also the second diagonal to finally uh, see what is the outcome so again took a smaller length balloon so this is a first a 1o and then I had a one point two, so the this is a one point uh, the one O and the one point two balloon, and then finally with the one point five balloon, see sequential dilatation of a very apical LED segment, all done. And uh, with lot of uh, so this is again the one O balloon in the most apical segment, because I have taken shoots, many of them are not saved here, so this is the. final i mean this is the flow which was established in the led so we can see that this led is a very thin caliber proximally the led is good and the flow is timi2 and in the diagonal again there is a <clears throat> good amount of thrombus throughout we did multiple act we kept the act about 300 and then uh, just dilated the diagonal 
and uh, after a lot of efforts, uh, finally we got a TME three flow in the LED. So this Dr. was the angle. Oh, water LED we are seeing just now, and we also have a guide catheter, which I guess is going to be seven trench. And uh, it doesn't uh, look like a one point five balloon LED. No, sir. The guide catheter is six trench, sir. And uh, whatever, I still feel could have used a uh, bigger uh, balloon. Two point five balloon. Yeah, bigger balloon. This is a uh, sir. I went up to a two o balloon, sir. Not a two point five. I couldn't uh, like because I this vessel is dizzy then uh, in spasm also. So whether it is a one point five or a one point seven five. What did you give for spasm? I gave sir Nicorandil. I did. I mean the micro channel dilators were uh, diltiazem, Nicorandil, adenosine, and uh, adrenaline. And intermittently, as per the blood pressure, uh, nitroglycerin was given. Nitroproside, I was not having. And I am not very confident about using it because it causes very severe hypotension. Sir, if I might add, you know, I had a similar situation where we had a lot of thrombus in a right coronary artery. Actually, probably pretty much I would have done the similar thing, but like what you did, you know, I think... Uh, I think the hesitation to start the case was right, I think, because you had a 20 hours of occlusion and you had a thought about it because every minute we spend with the patient being flat on the table, we have to be very careful. We don't lose the either ear. He doesn't go into cardiac arrest and things like that. So I think the hesitation is right because of the late presentation. But we had a similar situation where we had a huge right coronary artery, in, this, in my case, um, with a lot of clot. Uh, we tried to, thrombus couldn't be aspirated, et cetera. So what works in this situation is very well is if you take the microcatheter distal to the occlusion uh, into the as distal as possible, prove that the you are in the, sometimes the flow, in my case, the flow was not there in the PDR, PMD. I proved I was in the true vessel by taking the, both the branches, you know, showed that it was in the true lumen, you know, save that in the fluoro, take, took the microcatheter distal to the RC occlusion, I injected with the tenecteplase, 20 milligrams of tenecteplase. That's, that is a paper on distal thrombolysis works much better because it works between the microvasculature and you're occluded with a clot. So the anti the, the, the thrombolysis drug is locked between these parts and lyses the clot very well. Rather than proximal, in injecting through the guiding catheter, you take the microcatheter, make sure you're on the true vessel as much as possible, and then give 10 milligrams of tenecteplase weight and then if the, and then give another 10 mils. Maximum is 20 mils, I think they, 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 that paper was. So it works extremely well. Uh, distal thrombolysis, it works extremely well. Yes. In yes, fact, sir. most of the drugs should be given distally through the microcutter. Even your abscissimab, adrenaline, they work best if you give distally through the microcutter. So it's a, here in this case, I did the same. Like with every wire crossing and every possible thrombotic occlusion, I first delivered the drug in the first, it was the diagonal, then the diagonal mid LED and then the distal LED. And at this juncture, <clears throat> I thought of, because there is no now a critical lesion in the proximal segment, to just put the patient on uh, uh, like microchannel dilator, inotropes, LMWH and tyrofibin, and, and then reassess him with imaging after a short interval hmm. and accepted this result because I had established a TME3 flow, the whole vessel is diffusely diseased. And uh, as Sir has said that one of the options was uh, giving a thrombolytic, but then this is like a very uh, narrow caliber vessel and a diffusely diseased artery. A typical diabetic patient, maybe he has also a myocardial bridge, uh, which we are not able to see in this case. Yeah, definitely it is a diffusely diseased vessel, but there is also... A uh, some amount of thrombus and there is some uh, focal lesion up in the LED after the origin of the diagonal one. Probably would have dilated with a bigger balloon. Mostly it would have given better results. That's what I'm thinking retrospectively. Sir, the proximal lesion I have dilated with a bigger balloon, sir. No, no, after, D, after D1. Uh, diagonal after D1. Yeah, yes, sir. The, the, the diagonal at at this, uh, ah, yes, after yes. the D1, that extent, the ah, vessel which yeah, is looking correct, in the narrow. So, there, I mean, the I have done the pre dilatation, but that is a okay. recoil. So, now here I deferred the stenting, sir. I was now again with multiple con confusion. So, I thought of uh, let me just 
retake the patient after some time. Or... There, is, there is another strategy, yes. Yes, because if I deploy a stent and if there is a distal so much of obstruction, again, the risk of stent thrombosis is high. So, uh, again, uh, the follow up when the patient was shifted to the cath lab, uh, the patient developed a LV apical clot. And because there was no uh, <coughs> stent implanted, uh, after LMWH, we started the patient on Grior Oxaban 20 MB. And at 10th day follow up, there was almost you no, know, the uh, clot was almost not visible. So it was a soft clot. There was complete dissolution of the clot even at the 10th day. And uh, the patient was far better in uh, all states as in, compared. In, in the antiplated uh, uh, dosage? Uh, because I initially was on Ticagrelor, but because I had not uh, put a stent, I put him on a uh, aspirin, clopidogrel, and uh, rivaroxaban. And at uh, like we just stopped the clopidogrel because we increased the dose of rivaroxaban to a uh, higher dose for a LV apical clot. Otherwise, I would have put in on a 2.5 G BID rivaroxaban, clopidogrel, and aspirin a triple therapy. Sir, if this patient like uh, in a best possible center, what uh, different we can think here? So do we go with the stenting or do we go with the imaging and then decide or we? At this juncture, like after we have, because all, almost two, two hours are over, sir. This, and we have got a good flow. And then the that's, patient is also not so. It's that's better true. that you didn't stand. I think it's good that you didn't stand. It's always better yes. to wait. And if required, you go in again. But, uh, at that point, I don't think oh, you should Dr. stand Guru, it. Guru Nath, what is the advantage in waiting and not standing? Many times you don't, although the thrombus is not visible, there might be thrombus there and you can have, uh, after stenting, many times you have no flow. It happens yes. in this acute situation. Especially when you have, my experience is when you have slightly delayed presentation, maybe one, two days later, these are the patients who, you, who usually de develop slow flow, no flow. In acute situation, mm -hmm. that is less likely. And that's what he had. And after stenting, again, you will be in dilemma whether to post dilate, not to post dilate. Because after post dilatation, again, you have chances of slow flow, no flow. So he has yeah. achieved timid three flow. Yes. And, and, uh, amazing would have given some information about the size of the vessel. That is one thing we'll have take probably if things are available, would have taken a clue with that. Based on the sizing with an imaging, probably would have stent, taken a decision whether to stent or yes. not. Suppose yes. if the yes. LED is a good size, yeah. 2.5 million. If you have no imaging, I would probably oversize the stent a bit. Yeah. Like instead of putting uh, three, I would put a three five stent. Okay. And probably under deploy, like say maybe. Five with the maximum pressure that I use. And then, but I of, course, think then of course, the, you use the. Nobody's talking of elixir. Everybody's talking of something, something. And nobody's talking of elixir. Young patients, sir, we are using a lot of intracoronary elixir, sir. Dose, even like the dose, whatever is written 2.5 to 5 mg, but even a higher dose of 10 mg, we are not getting any uh, like bleeding outcome, but the flow establishment is very good after the intracoronal thrombolysis. Even today, we have done an angiogram on a 24-year-old male, and he has only he has got a grade 3 thrombus because he was thrombolyzed and taken. So, yeah. uh, like, we have a lot of STEMIs in the age group of 23, 24, 28, and they are all thrombus. Last week, we did an OCT study across the similar young 24-year male. So, even the OCT is not showing any lesion, not even a thin cap fibroatheroma. So, it has all healed in a period of one month. Okay. Questions in the chat box? Dr. Rishikesh? There are no questions. Maybe we should go to the last case, third case. Yes, sir. So there are no questions as of now in the chat box. So we can... Okay. Let's go to the next case. Who is presenting the third case? Yes, sir.
So if you have any interesting case, you can definitely show that will delight the audience. Oh, I wish you had told me earlier. <laughs> okay. Sir, I have one case on the this thing, like not in the PPT, the same similar case, sir. If allowed, I'll show that case. Uh, this uh, continuing in the same uh, uh, the same discussion we had. So this is a 53 year male. He is a heavy smoker, entry all MI, and uh, he is a day <coughs> day third of his uh, infarction. He is not lysed. He had a delayed presentation, but uh, the artery opened up and he is having a TME3 flow with almost a grade four thrombus in the proximal LED. And the lesion looks a uh, non-fibrotic lesion. So, so this it was a short lesion in the proximal LED, a eccentric lesion and a high thrombus burden. So the plan, uh, as uh, you said, sir, like to go with a direct stenting, maybe with a over oversized stent with at a lower pressure or with the regular stent at the uh, nominal pressure. So this case, I just took a. 4, 4 into 15 millimeter stent and uh, the plan was to do direct stenting uh, gradually. Uh, uh, the nominal pressure was a 8 atmospheric pressure, 8 to 11, 11 atmospheric pressure. So this deployed the stent at lower of 8 to 9 atmospheric pressure. And then this was the nightmare after the, like the uh, stent was deployed. The patient there was a, a migration of thrombus in the proximal uh, LED before the stent. There was another plaque. So I wanted to avoid the plaque by at the time of deployment of the stent. So I just thought of doing a focal stenting. And then uh, uh, the patient started getting chest pain, lot of hemodynamic compromise. Mm -hmm. uh, he was not intubated. He was started on only noradrenaline. And then uh, I just gave intracoronary uh, nicorandel, uh, the entire fibrin and adrenaline. And somehow a TME2 flow was established. So as uh, discussed, so it is always better to give the drugs delivery through a, a distal delivery, either using a cut balloon or a thrombuster. So took in a thrombuster and uh, gave, a, gave multiple uh, doses of uh, <clears throat> the same drugs. So one point, what I felt is that if we don't dilate the stent adequately, there is a difficulty in passing the thrombuster across the stent and it can damage the struts if the stent remains or if at point, if at some point, if the stent remains under expanded. We have, like I have one case where there was a stent uh, deformation because of uh, doing this during the angioplasty. And then after uh, giving all the thrombolytic drugs, uh, TME3 flow was established and the patient was stable and doing stable. Then diameter is one to one with the vessel diameter. Uh, actually, now whether it is a three point five or a four, I took a four O stent. Most of the time, uh, as per our sizing, we take a three point five stent. And then the proximal thrombus, we gave a patient with tyrofibrin and LMWH for few days, and then discharge him. Yeah, it's a, I think, nice cases, definitely. Probably uh, the prophylactic uh, wiring of the LCX probably would have been to, yes. to yes, some sir. extent. Yeah. Yes, sir. 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 Yes
in an acute uh, MI settings, even though it is a three days old, uh, probably that, that gives a, a better uh, um, a rescue strategy. And otherwise, I think you have dealt the cases very nicely. I think uh, good presentations. Thank you. Yeah. Ready, you are going to show any case? No, no, sir, no. Dr. Rishikesh, I yes, think sir. need to organize the meeting in a better way next time. All right. I mean, yes, we sir. have time still, and a lot of audience, including myself, they are waiting to see cases from Dr. Reddy and Dr. Gurunath. So you have not done good work, I would feel. They should have been told in advance that, yes, keep a ready, case ready. It could be any case. Even though we call it no thrombus, it need not be a thrombus-related case. I mean, we are all intervention cardiologists and on a given day, all kind of difficult cases they present, or sometimes we make the case difficult. Either way, we have to find solutions. And that's why any case which is difficult for Dr. Reddy or myself would like to exchange with each other. Definitely, sir. Next time, I think we will definitely do. Yeah. Yes. I, I have scheduled this meeting up to 9 o'clock, I believe. That is the reason why they have given chance for only two presenters. I, I understand. No, every time we have three, three presenters. Oh, okay. Okay. So we have uh, so usually two presentations, but uh, we are blessed to have Dr. Hiramat, sir, as director. So impromptu many a times, sir, presents uh, additional third case every time. Okay. 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 <laughs> But every time I pushing myself is not a good idea. So I was hoping that whoever so is chairing, like today, Dr. Reddy chairing, you should have, if you had told him, I'm sure he would have come up with the case. All right, we'll correct all these next time. We are done for the day. Yes, sir. All right. So I think we'll close today's meeting. And uh, thank you, Dr. Pranav. And the first presenter, first case Satish. presenter, I forgot his name. Dr. Satish. Dr. Satish. Dr. Satish. Guru Nath, you want to add anything? No, sir. No, sir. Absolutely. Nice presentations. Real practical problems we face every day. So what is your approach when you see a thrombotic vessel, especially the right coronary thrombus? It's a very difficult thrombus to handle because Thrombus has a tendency to slip forward. As well as backward. Sometimes I have seen strokes, strokes after because of the thrombus aspiration. So I haven't run to that as yet. Yeah. The embolic strokes much. have occurred while doing thrombus aspiration. So one thing which uh, I... Uh, mm, Practice is when I am aspirating a thrombus from a right coronary in acute situation. I I don't know, but usually when I usually I, we use side hole catheter. But for 
these cases i don't use side hole catheters because there is chance of thrombus migrating through the side holes and have having a stroke that's a little adjustment i make sir now there is a thrombus aspiration catheter from smt so you are expert opinion on it sir. you are talking about penumbra yes sir penumbra in the coronary sir mm hmm mm hmm by french compatible yeah, that is also, I think it is also coming up with some data uh, with a, a good results. And uh, another technique is, I think, a continuous uh, negative, uh, uh, I mean, keeping the pressure negative in the syringe is very, very important. I think many, many people just, they cannot uh, sustain the pressure negative for a long time. Therefore, that is the reason why the, uh, the thrombus gets migrated. And that is one of the things that should be avoided. Sir, uh, the aspiration we do with the thrombuster syringe, there are operators who are doing with the inflation device also. Uh, Correct. Any, like, any recommendation? All right, and, Dr. Rishikesh, I think we'll come to an end for today's yes. meeting. Yes, sir. Thank you all. Thank okay. you. Joining us, I think we all, I'm sure you understand, learn a lot of things from each other when we see and discuss this kind of cases. And MCURE has done a great service by bringing in your and your specialist to join this meeting so that we, I mean, it, it's no more monologues and we learn from each other every new meeting. And, and I'm sure uh, we all go with a lot of thoughts from our next case tomorrow. Dr. Gurnath, you want to add anything before we conclude? No, sir. No, sir. Close. Dr. Reddy, how about you? It's fine, sir. It's fine. I think uh, we'll uh, close this for today. I think uh, as per your session, I think we'll try to improve. I think we'll give a good uh, uh, thought process to the Dr. case to improve. Dr. Reddy, we are giving you a, a time slot of 10-12 minutes for presentation for the next meeting. Sure, sir. Definitely. Thank you, sir. Definitely. I'll do that. So even if Dr. Rishikesh forgets, it's an invitation from me for the next meeting, 10, 15 minutes presentation for you. 100%. All right, lovely. Sure, definitely. So we are nearly at the finish line, but before we conclude, let's express our gratitude to all those who have made this scientific program possible. I extend my deepest gratitude to our respected course director, Dr. Hiramat sir, for the guidance and expert comments. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our distinguished moderators, Professor Dr. K.M.K. Reddy, sir, and Dr. Gurunath Parale, sir, for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today. I would also like to thank Dr. Satish Parshuraman, sir, and Dr. Pranav Shamrat, sir, for their insightful case presentations. Your contribution has undoubtedly expanded our understanding pertaining to the cases discussed today. I would also like to thank our esteemed audience for their time, continued love, and support for this No Thrombosis program. On behalf of MCURE, I extend my heartfelt thanks to everyone from sales, marketing, and medical team at MCure who have contributed to this program success. So thank you all once again for attending and encouraging us. Good night and good time ahead. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night sir. Good night.